Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you from all over the world to this uh, webinar on online courts perspectives from the bench and bar. Uh, my name is uh, Professor David Wilkins. I'm a professor here at Harvard Law School and the director on the Center on the Legal Profession. Uh, and we are thrilled that we will be joined by over 1,000 people from around the globe to talk about this critically important topic. Uh, the Center on the Legal Profession uh, is a research institution here at Harvard Law School where I'm based, and we're really dedicated to three broad missions. One is to conduct world-class empirical research on the important issues facing the legal profession. The second is to help to rethink how to teach law students and practitioners uh, in a more innovative way. But the most important mission is to bridge what sometimes is the far too great gap between theory and practice or between practitioners and academics and members of the bench and bar uh, to talk about the critical issues facing our profession. This webinar comes out of that mission. And it started actually uh, several months ago uh, when my dear friend Richard Suskin, who I will introduce in a moment, uh, told me that he had written an important and largely at the time theoretical book around online courts and the future of justice. Uh, we said, we'd love to do a, a book launch for you and we were going to arrange for him to come to Harvard. Well, the world changed between January when we first had that discussion and the book was published and uh, April when the event was set for and it became a virtual event. Uh, but that event drew again, over a thousand people from all over the world uh, in which Richard presented his ideas which were no longer theoretical uh, and we had commentary from uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, Ralph Gantz, uh, who gave a wonderful reflections on, as a, as a judge, about how he thought about the developments Richard was talking about. Since that date, so much has happened and so many courts around the world have closed and so many proceedings have moved online. And Richard very generously agreed to update the thinking of his book in an important article which he published in our digital magazine, which we call The Practice uh, in July. And we said to Richard, we would love to have an opportunity to reconvene uh, this group of thought leaders and others who will join us to think about what the implications of your new thinking about online courts are. And that's what brings us here today. Uh, as you can see from the program, we have an incredible array of speakers, uh, beginning with Richard, who will kick us off with some reflections. Uh, then we will have a panel of incredible lawyers who are actively engaged in the process of navigating online courts, who I will introduce uh, when we begin that at 1030. Uh, then we are uh, will have a tribute to Justice Gantz, who sadly died earlier this fall, including a lecture by uh, Harold Coe, who is a mutual and dear friend. Then we will have a keynote address, which we are deeply honored uh, by Chancellor Voss, uh, as well as reflections by other leading judges and lawyers around the world. And then we'll end with next steps. Throughout this time, we will try to incorporate your voice as best we can. So please go to the Q&A function on the webinar and put in your questions. We have someone monitoring them and there'll be a lot of people and a lot of questions. So we certainly can't promise to get to everyone, but we will try to get to as many as we can or incorporate your thoughts and ideas into the dialogue. So, uh, this is really a, a deep honor for me uh, to be able to begin this 
discussion by turning to my friend Richard Susskind. Uh, he's a man who has many titles, who has done many things. Uh, I We've been friends for now, I think Richard, almost 15 years, maybe closer to 20 since he first began writing books about the future of the legal profession. Uh, he has become uh, an important voice on so many issues, roughly speaking at the intersection of technology and law. And perhaps for this purpose, most importantly, since uh, I think he said 1998, he's been the technology advisor to the Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales on this issue. So Richard will begin our discussion by giving us his reflections on what's happening with online courts today. Richard. David, can I just check that you can see my slides and hear my voice? Thank you very much and good day to everyone. Uh, David, it's always such a pleasure to collaborate with you. Thank you to you and your team for once again convening an event that brings interested parties from around the world together. And what a time we've had since we last convened to discuss this subject. I've got 20 minutes, as you see before you, to summarize what the future of courts might look like. And I thought I'd do that under four headings. I want to talk about the challenges that currently face us, the mindset that we should have in thinking about the future, the progress we've made, and what the future might look like. So let's start with the challenges. The reality is, and it's a harsh reality, that around the world, to varying degrees, many hearing rooms have closed. And as COVID, right around our world, brings both illness and poor health, it also is bringing large backlogs to our court systems. So it's had direct effect on access to justice. But even before COVID came, we had a problem. And I phrase it like this, that even in the most advanced legal systems, most civil disputes, for example, cost too much, they take too long, the process is excessively combative, it's also unintelligible, unless one's a lawyer, and is surely out of step in a digital society. This is my attempt to capture the access to justice problem. To make it more concrete, we see in some jurisdictions some staggering backlogs. 80 million cases in the courts of Brazil, 30 million in India. And I think worse still, the statistics according to the OECD, that only 46% of human beings live under the protection of the law. For all of us as lawyers, this is something I believe we should be collectively ashamed of. We have to do a better job. Our courts are not serving the people who frankly very often need the help and they simply cannot afford that assistance today. So we have a grave problem and I think we need a new mindset to sort out this problem. Let me take you to a meeting that I attended and spoke at not far from where David is today in Boston in late 2017 when I was asked to address a group of neurosurgeons, 2,000 neurosurgeons, further to a book I'd written called The Future of the Profession that I co-authored with my son, Daniel. Hey, uh, Richard, he asked me to be uh, controversial. Richard, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think what we're seeing on the screen is your presenter mode. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. Screen mode, that way people, I think it'll be easier for people to see the slides. And I see, I'll see you back here 30 seconds. It'll take you to do that. Okay. Perfect. How's that looking? Perfect. I won't offer to start again. <laughs> but let me take you again to Boston, to that conference when I was asked to speak to 2,000 neurosurgeons about the future of professional services. And at that event, they asked me to be controversial. So I said to them, patients don't want neurosurgeons. Gasp an audience. I said, patients want health. I said, for a particular type of health problem, I have no doubt you're the best answer we have today. But looking forward, perhaps 70 years from now, we'll perhaps think, in, in retrospect, or others will, isn't it amazing that we used to cut bodies open, how crude that was? Because I said the future of surgery is perhaps not robotic surgery, as they thought I'd be speaking on, but no surgery at all, because the future of healthcare is non-invasive treatment. And this led me to think that quite often when we ask about the future of courts, we're asking the wrong question. We shouldn't be asking 
what's the future of courts or what's the future of neurosurgery, we should be asking how in the future will we be solving the problems to which neurosurgery or courts, as the case may be, might be our best answer. So we have ways of working today, but we shouldn't think that tomorrow will necessarily be a cheaper, quicker, better version of what we have today. And there's another way of putting this, that in terms of technology, we tend to fixate on automation. The first 60 years of legal and court technology has been devoted to automation. The use of technology to streamline, to optimize, to improve, to enhance our traditional ways of working. What I'm more interested in is transformation. The use of technology fundamentally to change how we work, often to allow us to do things in entirely new ways. Simply streamlining and improving through automation gives us too often mess for less. What we want through transformation is a greatly improved service that allows far wider access, the far wider access that I believe many people are denied today. So this combination of what I call outcome thinking, think that we want, that patients want health rather than doctors, and this notion that what we should be looking at as transformation rather than automation leads me, and this is the final mindset observation, to ask this very simple question, is court a service or a place? Do we really need physically to assemble in one place to resolve our differences or might be the new and different ways of re resolving our disputes? So what progress have we made towards the notion of court being a place, a service rather than a place? Well, as David noted in mid-March and from then on, courts around the world have closed. And what sprung up, and I use this term very generically, have what we call remote courts. And remote courts is the term we certainly use in the UK to cover three different possibilities. Now, remote courts worldwide, the address for that is remotecourts.org, is a service that I've been involved in putting together, which tracks and records the progress that many countries, jurisdictions are making in moving their courts from physical courtrooms to remote courts during the crisis. And there's three types of remote court that have emerged. The audio hearing, the video hearing, and the paper hearing. The audio hearing, as one might expect, essentially a hearing by telephone conference call. The video hearing, using technologies much like the technology we have just now, is a hearing by video. And thirdly, there's the paper hearing, which is not really a hearing at all. That's when um, the evidence and arguments are submitted in electronic form to judges and there's some kind of online argument, but it's more in the manner of an exchange of emails and the judge responds with their determination in the same way. There's no oral evidence, there's no physical hearing. These are the three options we have under the heading of remote hearings. These are the three alternatives to the physical court hearing. The audio and visual, video, remember, come also in two sorts. One is where it's a full audio and video hearing where everyone is participating in the same way. And the second is a partial or maybe sometimes called a hybrid hearing where some people are in a physical courtroom and others are connected in by audio or video. But they are the range of options we have to, today. And in relation to that, I want to make four observations, uh, four conclusions really that I draw from the experience of the last six months. The first is that overwhelmingly, I think the preferred form of remote hearing has been the video hearing. And the reality is the video hearings work fairly well. I think if you've asked most judges and lawyers in say January, what they thought of video hearings, they would have expressed an instinctive, a visceral, uh, but rather negative view of their potential. They'd have drawn attention to all sorts of limitations, but all the experience, and in fact, the serious empirical studies, for example, by the Civil Justice Council in England and Wales, suggest a fairly high level of satisfaction amongst judges and lawyers who are using video hearings. So that's a first conclusion. A second conclusion that interests me is that judges and lawyers can adapt quite quickly. It's commonly said, and I think it remains true, that judges and lawyers are fairly conservative. Indeed, in the book that I wrote with my son, when we looked across many professions, uh, other than the clergy, judges and lawyers seem to be the most conservative at all. But isn't it fascinating in this time of great pressure, when judges and lawyers really needed to, how quickly they adapted? how quickly to change, the speed with which new protocols come out, the familiarity with which very quickly lawyers and judges had with the new enabling technology. And I think there's a major lesson for us there. When judges and lawyers need to change, they can indeed. And that's my second observation. The third observation is that 
during this period, minds have been opened and indeed some minds have been changed. Many people who wouldn't have dreamt of using video hearings in January now find it second nature. And many other people are of the view, we will never go back. This is the start of a long journey towards transformation in the justice system. And the fourth conclusion I want to draw is that I think COVID-19 has, has both accelerated and decelerated technological change. There is a common, but I think slightly simplistic view that it's accelerated everything. Uh, my son Daniel and I produced in, towards the end of March, uh, a little model that explained how it was we thought or the five stages of recovery that the profession would go through in, in moving through COVID. The first was mobilization, essentially setting up remote working. The second was lockdown, self-evident. The third, emergence, which is really where we find ourselves today to varying degrees coming out of uh, COVID, but still sometimes looping back around as we sadly are in England uh, to lockdown. But when the vaccines are put in place, or when there's far more effective treatment or far better testing, we can imagine the economy being turned on, a great surge of activity, and in due course, a new equilibrium will be established. But when you look at that diagram, and here what I've tried to map is the, the red line refers to automation and the blue line refers to transformation. We've seen a great leap in automation, the use of technologies to help us communicate and collaborate and cooperate more effectively, great investment there, but many of the transformative technologies has actually been put on back burner. Now, I think I'm often, uh, and this has happened since the last lecture, people say to me, Richard, the future you depict has arrived, job done as it were, uh, um, what you've said about the future has now come to pass. Uh, I, I don't think the future hasn't ar has arrived yet. I don't think home working is a full transformation. I don't think dropping hearings into Zoom is a shift in paradigm, as many would want us to believe, because the reality is the people involved, the rules involved, the processes and the problems remain much the same. We still have the access to justice problem, whether or not we're actually hearing cases by video. So COVID-19, I think, is best regarded as an experiment. It's an experiment during which we need to gather data about what works well, what doesn't work well, and what works well, we should certainly industrialize. Uh, and COVID-19 offers a springboard, I have no doubt, into a new world. There are, by the way, some hints of a new orthodoxy emerging. We might see some of this today, where people believe now the only remote alternative is the, is the video hearing room. It's now become the new comfort zone of many judges and lawyers. But my message today to you folks is that we're just at the foothills. Uh, I believe what we've seen here, and COVID's a springboard, is we've seen a glimpse of the notion that court service, indeed legal service, might be delivered in entirely new ways. So let me give you a sense of this future. To some extent, I'll be leapfrogging some of the discussion that follows, because we're going to hear from some very experienced practitioners about their direct first-hand um, daily activities uh, through video hearings. But I want to leapfrog that to some extent and take you to the future. And in a way, back to this book I wrote, and people are kind when they say I was prescient, but the reality is two things. One, of course, I had no sense that the pandemic was coming. And secondly, much of my book, although there's some on video hearings, much of my book was in fact devoted to the paper hearing, to this idea of there not being physical courtrooms or oral hearings at all. My interest was in high volumes of low value cases where people were denied access to justice, that we needed a fundamentally new way of delivering the court service. And pivotal to my view of the future is, as one might expect, and as David advertised, the notion of technology. I could give you a chapter and verse about what technology is doing, how it's changing our society and economy, but just let me summarize it in two propositions. Our systems are becoming increasingly capable. Uh, you can call it AI, you can call it blockchain, you can call it machine learning, you can refer to all sorts of enabling technologies, but the bigger point is this, that our systems are able to do more and more. Certainly pre-COVID, barely a day passed when you didn't hear news of some system or app or technological breakthrough. Often systems that were taking on tasks that historically we thought could only be taken on by human beings. So our systems are becoming increasingly capable. The pace of change is accelerating and there's no obvious finishing line. No one in China or Silicon Valley or South Korea are, uh, is dusting their hands off and saying job done. That's the technology project over. Quite the reverse, I'll say again, the pace of change is accelerating. And that leads me to think that there are going to be five main features 
of the court system of the future over and above, this isn't replacing, but it's over and above the physical hearing room, which will of course be used in many cases, the video hearing room, which already we've seen uh, uh, successfully in action. But I think we've got to look further to five phenomena, the asynchronous online judging process, I'm going to explain each of these terms, extended court services, as I call them, front ends, artificial intelligence and dispute avoidance. So let me say just a, a couple of minutes on each. The idea of the asynchronous hearing, it's a funny old term, asynchronous and synchronous, it's from communication theory. Synchronous communication is when the people communicating need to be available at the same time. When you have a phone call, when you have a meeting, when you have a video conference, that synchronous process, you need to be available at the same time. Asynchronous is when you don't. The text message, the email, where you communicate at your own convenience. Now, I carry this idea forward in my book to the idea of online judging, and it's not an entirely new phenomenon at all. We've seen cases decided in the papers alone for many years and in many appeal courts around the world, but I want to industrialize this. So this, again, to re reiterate the notion of the paper hearing, this is the idea that evidence and arguments are submitted not orally, but in electronic form. There's some kind of online debate and discussion conducted asynchronously with judges and the parties, and therefore at their convenience, from their kitchen table or whatever time of day matters to them, no time off work, no forbidding oral hearing. Remember, I'm thinking about high volumes of low value cases. That's the process of online judging. We're not talking about artificial intelligence at this stage. We're talking about human, qualified human judges working in an entirely new way. And I can take you to places around the world, most notably, I think, in the Civil Resolution Tribunal in Canada, but we've seen evidence of this in, Eng in England, in Australia, in China, United States too, where this is actually, it's early days, but it's working and the level of satisfaction from court users is very high indeed. And all of that is dealt with in, in my research. Let me turn then to the extended court services. And for many people, this is more challenging and perhaps even unconstitutional. The point I make here is that in a digital society, I think we need to do more. And in our particular digital society, we need to do more to help people who are appearing before courts, even if they appear through some asynchronous process or through some more relaxed virtual hearing. The harsh reality is there is a gulf between having access to the courts and being able to use the courts without lawyers. And so many people for many years have said, oh, the answer to the access to justice problem is to put up websites so people understand their entitlements. But I say there's a justice gulf between understanding your rights and enforcing your rights. And traditionally that gulf is bridged by lawyers. But in a world where frankly, most people can't afford lawyers, in a world where if we're realistic, public legal funding is likely to go down rather than up. We have to find radically new ways of helping people to understand their entitlements. And so what I call the extended court, and I argue in my book that this is a legitimate secondary function of the court system, the primary function being the delivery of binding authoritative decisions, a secondary function is the provision of help to help people understand their rights and entitlements, to help people understand the remedies and options available to them, to help people formulate their arguments, to help people organize their evidence, to provide online tools to help parties negotiate and be facilitated, not as a private sector alternative, but baked in the system. And that's what I call the extended court system. And that was what I call for in my book, for in my book, I define online courts, or my focus is online judging combined with extended courts. But since then, I've recognized there may be a different approach, a complementary approach. And because our court system is suffering so badly from so many back backlogs arising out of COVID, the extended court phenomenon, and I cover this as a possibility in my book, but for reasons I won't detain you with today, rejected it in the first instance, uh, but I can now see there's a private sector alternative or a non-state provided alternative to the extended courts, and I call them front ends. And in the article that David mentioned to, to you that I, I was invited to write for their online publication, uh, The Practice, I explained this in some detail. But the way to think of it is, rather than having these extended court services within 
the court system, they could hover, as it were, as a front end on top of or to the side of the court system. And these could be provided by private sector providers, they could be provided by charities, they might be provided by educational bodies. But again, these front ends would allow people to understand uh, their entitlements, to understand the options available to them, to help them marshal their arguments and organize their evidence, and to provide tools to provide essentially a form of online ADR. We often call it, call it online dispute resolution. So whether or not we see them as part of a state provided service or whether or not we pull them out as a front end that is in some way yet to be identified, some way integrated with the court service, I don't mind. But I do think that simply making dispute resolution by the state more available is only half the battle. We need to give people a lot more help. We're working on this in LawTech UK, incidentally, which is a, a body set up in the UK to help promote and encourage greater use of technology in our legal and court systems. And we have a, a project exploring precisely how this kind of front end might work in practice. A little bit artificial intelligence, very little, because I just want to plant the thought. Uh, I wrote my PhD on AI and law at Oxford in the 80s. Uh, I say this to you, that most of the short-term predictions being made about the impact of AI in the law hugely overstate its impact. However, and more importantly, most of the long-term predictions hugely understate its impact. Will AI transform the law within the next couple of years? Not a bit of it. By 2030, I think we'll see very substantial change. The 20s is the decade during which AI takes over. But what I don't want people to think, and this is a, a cartoon that was, appeared in The Economist in a review of our book, which is called Professor Dr. Robot QC. I don't want to think, or people to think, that what we have in mind here is essentially that when you come into your office one day, there's a machine, a robot sitting there, uh, having taken your place. That's about as sensible as thinking that self-driving cars are going to have robots sitting in a regular car. When one starts thinking about the outputs, the outcomes that clients actually need, that doesn't need to be delivered by a robot with arms and nostrils. Uh, the whole notion of a robot lawyer is for me misconceived. It anthropomorphizes the way we deliver services. The reality is that emerging AIs will take on many of the tasks that lawyers take on, not by copying or replicating the way we work, but by working we're really by building on their distinctive capabilities, huge processing power, massive quantities of data, very clever algorithms. But for those people who say things like a computer can't be creative, imaginative, a computer can't think, all of these things are true, but computers do not need to be creative or imaginative or capable of cognition to outperform us. We're already seeing this. The final observation is that we need, I, I think under the heading of AI, we need to distinguish between the AI providing legal help to help people understand their rights and entitlements. And the idea that I built on in my last presentation, which was we can imagine a form of determination by a state body that is based on these predictive systems that are emerging, systems that predict the outcome of cases. Finally, dispute avoidance. In the end, I've never met a client who prefer a great dispute, great big dispute, well resolved by a lawyer to not having a dispute at all. Clients want a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. And this means in the future that the whole notion of legal risk management will be as important as legal problem solving. What about justice, I hear you cry? Well, again, this is when in fact, where I come in, it's why I wrote the book in the first place. It's my preoccupation. People both invoke justice to criticize online courts as well as to support them. When I unpacked this, I identified seven different concepts of justice that we use in our discussions of online courts and of courts generally. Each of them, I think, can be applied in the context of online courts. There is a debate to be had about the extent to which online or physical courts deliver more or less access under each of these headings, but that's very much for another talk. I throw these up there in, in my conclusion, just to show that we are thinking about these issues, those of us who are thinking about technology. In the end, what we're trying to do is improve access to justice.